Very good. Yay. I've had problems with the, this adapter in the past, so it's always good to have a backup. Thank you. Uh, so I'm Michael Ducey. Uh, I work for a company called Sysdig. Uh, you might have seen us uh, in the little room off to the side. Um, I'm not going to talk about Sysdig. Uh, I'm going to talk about DevOps and Cloud Native. Uh, so I do community and evangelism for um, Sysdig, and I've been in the DevOps community for a, a very long time. Uh, some of you might remember me from the very first DevOps days that we had in Amsterdam. Uh, where I talked about the Big Lebowski and how the Big Lebowski is related to DevOps. And a lot has changed over the last six years or five years, actually. Uh, and it's interesting to see how these new technology patterns have emerged. So uh, how many people have re are, are in the process of or who have recently went through uh, a DevOps transformation in your organization? Anyone? A few of you, right? And so you put in all this effort and you put in all this work and now this newfangled thing, because technology progresses, and this newfangled thing called cloud native uh, and Kubernetes and containers has come out. So how do we begin to map this new world back to these principles that we've had for a long time and that we've been talking about for a long time in the world of DevOps? And that's what I'm gonna talk about today. So I'm gonna start by clarifying DevOps. Uh, Bridget actually did a really good job of taking a section of my abstract and presenting it this morning, so I appreciate that. <laughs> So uh, instead of redefining what Kubernetes is and containers are and things like that, I'm gonna go back and talk about how uh, we actually map those ideas into what we defined as DevOps 10 years ago uh, or even further. Uh, I'm gonna talk about what cloud native is and then I'm gonna talk about the intersection of DevOps and cloud native and then briefly touch on roles in the cloud native world as well. So as Bridget pointed out in her opening, uh, the origins of DevOps comes from Andrew Clay Schaefer proposing this idea of amp agile infrastructure. And of course, uh, I always get confused about who proposed it and who went to the talk. Uh, maybe Patrick will correct me afterwards. Uh, but proposes this idea of agile infrastructure, birds of a feather at the agile conference in Toronto. One person shows up, Patrick Dubois. Uh, now there's the other story is that Patrick proposed the talk and the only person that showed up was Andrew. I don't know who showed up and who proposed it, but it was something like this, so <laughs> play along. Uh, in 2009, we had a talk by uh, two gentlemen by the name of John Osball and Paul Hammond, and they gave a talk at Velocity entitled 10 deploys per day, which back then 10 deploys per day was like, wow, right? And now we're talking about 1,000 deploys per day. Uh, for some of you though, 10 deploys per day may still be really significant, and if you get, get to that level, or one deploy per week could be significant for you. This is all within the context of your organization, but they really defined a lot of principles in this talk around really uh, how devs and operations can get along better together and how they can work more collaboratively. Uh, and then in 2009, uh, we had the first DevOps days in Ghent, Belgium, hosted by Patrick Dubois, uh, Chris uh, Boithart, uh, and many others as well, who got that conference going. And now we are here today, right? We have new core organizers, such as Bridget and Matt, that are helping run the organization. We're up to 64 DevOps days worldwide uh, this year. Uh, Bridget kindly, finally has allowed more than one DevOps days to happen in the same week, which is nice. Uh, but it's, it's amazing to see the community grow and uh, the scale that it's gotten to. Uh, I organize DevOps Days Columbus in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, so if anyone's interested in coming to the States uh, and visiting beautiful Ohio in September, I uh, welcome submissions to our CFP. Now in 2010, uh, John Willis, uh, who has spoke at DevOps Days Amsterdam in the past, uh, and another gentleman by the name of Damon Edwards coined this term called CAMS. And I think CAMS is really what I define as the first principles of DevOps, right? And so first principles are this idea in philosophy and physics uh, of a principle that can't be derived from something else. Uh, and so uh, an example of a first principle is uh, man is mortal, Socrates is a man, thus Socrates is mortal. So Socrates is mortal is not a first principle, but man is mortal is a first principle. So they defined this idea of culture automation, lean measurement and sharing, and lean came in a little bit later when Jez Humble started to contribute to the definition of DevOps and us starting to look more into the continuous integration, continuous delivery space, and how that overlaps with what we were trying to do in the world of DevOps. And so let me go through each one of these real quickly. So culture, so 
culture is all about this idea of people over process, uh, enabling people to have the freedom to fail, uh, and more importantly, the freedom to fail and learn from failure. So failure is extremely important as a way for us to learn. And then anyone who has kids knows uh, that failure is something that you do as a parent, uh, and that you also see sometimes that your kids do as well. And the more healthy thing to do to your kids is not to scold them when they fail, but to teach them how they can learn from those failures uh, and, and be a better person. And I think the thing that I've liked the most about the world of DevOps, and it's something that personally has helped me a lot, uh, is this culture aspect. So the people being important, the healthy culture around people, uh, treating everyone as uh, a valuable member of the team and who has different experiences and a different worldview that we can all learn from. And I think uh, in, in today's world, I think that's one of the more important things that we need to think about is that everyone's different, everyone has something to contribute, and it's just learning how to listen to those people. Automation uh, is extremely important in the world of DevOps, so automation of your entire software delivery lifecycle, and that goes to that idea of 10 deploys per day. You have to have this level of automation to achieve that level of uh, deploys per day. And when we talked about DevOps, uh, we focused on these ideas of infrastructure as code, uh, continuous integration, and continuous delivery. So how do we define our infrastructure in a way that we can then uh, treat it the same way that we treat our development code, and how can we begin to merge the two? Uh, lean is also a big aspect of DevOps and that we've talked about and we've incorporated principles and ideas from other, uh, other industries and how can we learn more from those other industries. So going back to this idea is that we don't necessarily know the solution to everything. Other people in other places might have good ideas that they can contribute. And the thing that I've found most interesting about DevOps is that we often look into other industries to pull learnings from them. And lean is one of those areas. So it's an idea of a manufacturing process. I've talked about it here before at DevOps Days Amsterdam. And it really pulls back the ideas from the Toyota production system. And what it really focuses on is this idea of removing waste from processes. So where am I spending time that I don't need to be spending where I could automate something, uh, perhaps? Uh, a good example is uh, I'm having to stand up a bunch of workstations for workshops that I do. Uh, and I've reached the point, everyone's seen the XKCD article, or not article, comic, where like, what's the return on automation and when, she, when you should return on some, uh, when, you, when should you automate a process? Uh, and that's this whole idea, right? So I'm having to stand up all these workstations and I've long reached the point where I should have automated this entire process a long, long time ago. Uh, so I have a lot of waste that I could remove from my process. Uh, measurement is important, and measurement is important in a couple different ways. Um, measurement is important from the perspective of performance metrics of not only uh, the metrics of how your application and your services that you're deploying are performing, but also metrics around processes. So how uh, much waste do I have uh, in my processes? Uh, and also, uh, um, how can I actually improve those processes and show some real business impact of improving those processes? And then another aspect that I think that originally when we defined the term comms uh, as a group in the, in the DevOps world, we didn't really think of uh, at first, but there are important people metrics that you need to look at as well. So what is the health of the organization as far as turnover? Are people happy? Are people being burnt out? And other ideas like that as well. And there are a lot of people metrics that you can look at. And a great example of using measurement in the world of DevOps is the DevOps Research Associates, or DORA. Uh, they have, for the longest time, co-authored a state of DevOps report with Puppet. Uh, they're now doing this on their own as well. And this is led by people such as Jez Humble and Gene Kim and Nicole Forsgren and Sue Choi uh, that really look at how, if I'm implementing DevOps in my organization, what are the results that I can expect to get? And it's a way for us as practitioners to take back to our leaders uh, some ideas that if I do DevOps in my organization, I'm gonna get some benefit to the entire organization, just not the technology knob turning things that we care about as practitioners. Uh, and then lastly, sharing. So sharing works in a couple different ways. And uh, I think a great example of this, so, uh, is, is what Microsoft is doing and what other large organizations are doing. So I understand there's still some angst in the open source community 
Uh, I remember 20 years ago uh, how Microsoft was. Uh, I would never, if you told me 20 years ago that Microsoft would be one of the largest contributors to open source and uh, things in the world of Linux, I would never have believed it 20 years ago because I couldn't even get uh, open office and Word to work correctly with one another. Um, but what this level of sharing has done is really opened up this idea of how do I share within my organization? So companies are gigantic these days. And so you might be part of a 20 person team in a 3000 person organization with 1500 people uh, in the technology organization that are doing something around the world of DevOps. Uh, so how do I take that and how do I spread it out between that entire organization so that we can more, work more effectively? So that's inter-organization sharing. And then there's inter-organization sharing or between organizations, and that's where uh, organizations are allowing their employees to work on open source projects publicly. They're allowed to publish their own open source projects under that brand of the corporation. Uh, and they're able to basically share these best practices and learning to improve the overall industry. And I think that's why we see the rate of innovation increasing greatly, is because we're able to do this sharing that we've not been able to do uh, uh, for the longest time, and it really found its roots in the open source movement, right? So let's define DevOps. So we've defined DevOps from a principles perspective, but let's put an overall definition on it. And one definition that I always like to use uh, is uh, DevOps is a cultural and professional movement focused on how we build and operate high velocity organizations born from the experiences of its practitioners. And this is by Adam Jacob, the CTO of Chef. Now, um, so let's now that we have this foundational uh, view of what DevOps is, let's move into cloud native and define what cloud native is. So how many people run what they would call cloud native applications? All right, so a handful of you. So for some of you, uh, this, what? Those are the Americans. Those are the Americans. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. I thought they were the Germans. They've been so busy focused on cloud native that they forgot how to play football. <laughs> Sorry. My son was devastated, by the way, because he was rooting for Germany. And like my wife told me yesterday that he, he was very, very mad yesterday uh, about 6 o'clock. So uh, let's define cloud native. So this is. Uh, this is actually the old definition from the uh, Cloud Native Computing Foundation. They've updated it within the past uh, week or so. Um, but it, it's a good technological definition of what Cloud Native means. So Cloud Native Computing uses an open source software stack to be containerized, dynamically orchestrated, and microservices oriented, right? So if you look at this, this is very much an architectural pattern, right? This is not necessarily processes per se, but it defines the technology stack that we want to have an application that can be uh, operated in a cloud native fashion. Now there's other definitions as well, uh, and I think this is, a, this is a definition that looks similar to uh, the definition that Adam Jacob gave for DevOps. Uh, so uh, Joe Beta of Heptio uh, defines it as cloud native is structuring teams, culture, and technology to utilize automation and architectures to manage complexity and to unlock velocity. And I think the really key c component around Adam's definition and Joe's definition uh, is this idea of uh, unlocking velocity. So how can we move faster as an organization? The other interesting thing that I find about Joe's definition is that uh, it does have a component of structuring teams and also a culture aspect as well. But if you jump back to this definition, there's absolutely nothing in that definition that talks about teams, that talks about uh, those sorts of aspects or culture uh, as well. So how can we start to merge the two and blend these two? Uh, there's another definition uh, by uh, Pivotal. Um, and Pivotal defines it as cloud native is an approach to building and running applications that fully exploit the advantages of the cloud computing model. So they also uh, have this diagram that kind of shows the intersection of multiple different things. And I like this definition because it gives you a good idea of where the pieces and components uh, lie. How do they overlap with one another? Well, not necessarily overlap, but how do they all kind of come together to deliver on this promise of what we call cloud native? And this is from uh, their definition that you can find there next to my Twitter handle. Should have fixed that alignment, sorry. 
Uh, but what's interesting is that it incorporates the principles of microservices. It incorporates this idea of the speed that containers can give us, as Bridget talked about, this idea of reproducible builds, reproducible deployments. Uh, and then also these principles of continuous delivery that we've been talking about for a long time in the DevOps world. So by this point, you might be a little bit confused. So let me break this down and give you a little bit more about the intersection of the two. So uh, what is cloud native? So I would redefine this definition just a little bit. So uh, cloud native is an approach to building and running applications that fully exploit the advantages of the cloud computing model. In particular, cloud native takes advantage of the technological advances to build and deploy applications that are containerized dynamically orchestrated and microservices oriented. And what you notice about this definition is that there's nothing about culture uh, and there's nothing about uh, other aspects that we talk about a lot in the world of uh, DevOps. And so let's break down how we begin to combine DevOps and cloud native as one. So let's put the two definitions next to each other. So a cultural and professional movement focused on culture, automation, lean measurement and sharing. Uh, and cloud native is a technological paradigm focused on a repeatable pattern of building applications in the cloud, leveraging containers, automation, and microservices. And I would even go further to say, leveraging some of the uh, built-in services that cloud providers give to us that make it much, much easier to deploy applications and taking a lot of the management overhead away from us. And I just pause because I see a bunch of people taking pictures. <laughs> So let's break down cloud native uh, in the world of comms, right? So if we think about culture and what is included in the world of culture, uh, so we have things like a blameless culture, we have inclusion and diversity, which I think is uh, very, very important in the world of DevOps uh, and just uh, in life in general. Uh, Self-care, so making sure that people aren't burning themselves out, making sure that they have uh, a good work-life balance. Uh, which is a little overloaded term from time to time, uh, and having this idea that you can fail fast. And then down at the bottom, we have sharing, uh, which focuses on things like open source, uh, public postmortems, which a great example of that, uh, which has been happening maybe a little bit too much recently, is uh, what GitLab is doing, and they publish uh, a lot of, when they have an outage, you can go and you can actually watch them work the outage, which I think is really important. They're very uh, vulnerable that way, but as a practitioner, you can actually gain a lot of insights by seeing how somebody works that outage uh, and solves that problem, uh, and solve that problem at scale as well. Uh, and then also public presentations. So the ability for, I think it's great that we have this idea of 64 DevOps days throughout the world that's local to each little community throughout the world that has their own little local vibe uh, to them. And these public presentations are really, really important for us to share knowledge and spread that knowledge so that more and more people can be uh, uh, familiar with these ideas. However, half of the audience is their first time at a DevOps days. So um, then let's look at in the middle, we have this idea of automation, lean measurement and sharing. So let me break down now of how cloud native contributes to automation, lean measurement and sharing. I was actually supposed to say that on that slide. <laughs> All right, so automation. So one important thing uh, when you think about the world of cloud native is that, uh, first off, cloud native improves DevOps is the way uh, I would define it. So one important aspect is that automation is a first principle of cloud native. So uh, automation principles are built into the platform. You may not feel them like you used to when you used to write uh, an Ansible playbook or uh, a puppet manifest, uh, be but because they're abstracted behind the scenes, but there's a lot of automation that takes place in platforms such as Cloud Foundry and Kubernetes and Mesosphere that you don't see. And this is all the dirt that we used to have to do, that we've now optimized these processes and we've put them behind the scenes, behind an abstraction, and a lot of this work is taken care of for us automatically. Uh, and also what's important is that the tenants of scaling is, are built into the platform. So Adam also used to say, Adam Jacob of Chef also used to say is that you don't have a scalability problem until you have a scalability problem. So why would you, uh, the first thing that you do, go and solve the scalability problem uh, on day one? 
we'll write the application, get an application that people want to use, and everyone thinks that they're going to have a million users on the first day, but in reality, you're probably not gonna have a million users until like three years from now, right? So why would you solve scaling from day one? What's interesting though is that cloud native actually gives you a lot of these principles of scaling built into the platform. So that when it does come further down, the things that you're worried about solving are within your own application and not necessarily within the infrastructure of handling these scaling problems. Uh, automation makes infrastructure's code much, much easier. Who's ever went through uh, a test kitchen loop of debugging uh, maybe your manifest or your playbook uh, or whatever it might be, uh, chef cookbook, and uh, you just have to keep going over and over and over again until the node converges correctly, right? So the important thing is, is that infrastructure's code is much easier because you have this principle of immutability of containers. So you know exactly what you're going to deploy. Uh, you're further abstracted away from the infrastructure and so there's layers of automation that are built in. Uh, and what's interesting is that it becomes a lot less brittle than traditional configuration management, as having this idea of a further abstraction and more automation built into the platform. Uh, and a great example of this is what a company by the name of WeWorks is doing around the idea of GitOps. And GitOps is basically how do I take this principle of infrastructure as code and what we've been talking about for uh, the last several years in the world of DevOps and how do I apply it if I'm deploying my applications on Kubernetes? How do I keep my manifest or my uh, deployment YAML, uh, because we're all YAML engineers now, how do I keep that in a source code repository? How do I test it? And how can I have this rolling deployment uh, with a platform such as Kubernetes and building on these ideas of infrastructure as code? Uh, orchestration is incorporated from the start as well in the world of cloud native. Uh, so as I've already kind of mentioned, Kubernetes abstracts away a lot of the operation principles and dirty work that we would have to do uh, uh, on day two. Uh, it ab abstracts a lot of those scaling concerns as well. And it also provides robust resource constraints as well. And I think this is one of the areas that we don't talk about enough is that you can control on a very granular level uh, what your applications can have access to, uh, what resources they can use, how much of that resource that they can use. And you can do it on a much finer grain scale than we were ever able to do it in the world of VMs, right? Uh, and then also principles around automatic circuit breakers as well. So there's a new idea uh, that's getting more popular. Uh, Hashi Corp made an announcement where uh, console, is console or Nomad? Console, console Connect, uh, which is essentially a service mesh. Uh, there's several other vendors that play in the service mesh space such as Buoyant, uh, there's Linkerd, there's Envoy, there is TCO as well. Uh, and this whole idea is like, uh, built around this idea of how can I build a proxy for service requests? So in a microservices world, we don't care about the individual containers themselves and that health. What we care about is the over overall health of the service. So how can I have one common point in my application where I can instrument these things to find out uh, when, a, when a service goes abnormal? How can I automatically turn that service off uh, automatically when I start to see that one particular service uh, go red? Uh, and how can I detect those conditions and then respond to them appropriately? And cloud native has a lot of these promises. It's still early days for service mesh, but there are some people that are using it in production. It's kind of probably around the days of uh, when Bridget mentioned uh, doing Docker in production in 2013. Uh, but it's still there and it still has a lot of promise and the momentum is definitely behind this, these projects. Uh, so let's jump into measuring. Uh, let me just check my time, sorry. Should probably know that, right? All right. <laughs> I forgot to start my timer, that's why. All right, so measurement uh, is this idea of having this common instrumentation point of develop for developers. And so Cloud Native gives us that. Cloud Native gives us that uh, through something called Prometheus. And what Prometheus allows us to do is that developers can write towards a standard spec for instrumenting their applications. And then it's much, much easier to go and scrape data out of that application to instrument that application. We now have a standard, a pseudo standard of how developers can instrument their applications. And then I have a pseudo standard, or standard, uh, not pseudo, not pseudo. Uh, so I have this standard now of where as an operations person, I can go and pull those metrics back and store it in a, a data store for them so we can go back and look at the overall health of the application. 
And instrumentation equals visibility. If you can't uh, instrument your application, if you can't see how it's performing, then you can't improve it. Uh, uh, you can't measure, if you don't measure something, you can't improve it is kind of the principle there. Uh, we also have these new things such as distributed tracing, which is another area that's still kind of new, but it's getting extremely interesting of what they can provide. There's things like Jaeger and Open Tracing and Zipkin. And what it allows you to do is this correlation of events through a distributed stack. So the whole uh, honest status page that uh, Bridget showed earlier, this is trying to solve that honest status, status page problem of now debugging a microservice is like solving a murder mystery. Uh, I don't know, do, we all, do you all have the game Clue over here in Europe? Yeah, so that's how you troubleshoot a distributed system these days. But, uh, distributed tracing makes this much, much easier. It gives you higher visibility into bottlenecks, sources of failure, potential points to optimize is another thing that it gives you uh, uh, um, visibility into as well. So if I have one particular service that's performing poorly and I need to go and do a lean exercise to actually optimize my stack, I have great visibility into where my components are the slowest and where I can begin to optimize those components and shift the bottleneck around to another place. Uh, also around measurement, Service Mesh provides a lot of instrumentation around this as well. So things like success, retries, and error rates as well for your applications uh, when you're running them in a microservices type fashion. Uh, lean, uh, I kind of see lean as a side effect of cloud native. So as we've built automation into the platform, as we make it easier to consume measurement, uh, and visibility and easier for developers to instrument their own code. Uh, the side effect is that processes can be improved to increase velocity and agility, uh, kind of going back to Joe's definition. Points of friction are removed as well because it's easier to deploy uh, and a lot of the handoffs that we had to do are being eliminated and being pushed further, further down the stack that are abstracted away from us. Uh, and best practices are built into the platform. So these best practices around automation where uh, who used to try and do configuration management where you would have this base set of cookbooks that everyone would have to apply. And it was like, well, this is the standard uh, Apache cookbook. Why don't you use my standard Apache cookbook that I built for the entire organization? Right? And this is our idea of trying to bake best practices into the platform. Well, the thing is, is that we were baking the wrong best practices into the platform. The thing that you want to bake in is abstracting away the infrastructure, not necessarily abstracting away how the applications built and how the applications ran. So let's go back to this idea of 10 deploys a day and let's tie these two together. Uh, so if we go back to the ideas that John Ospaugh and Phil Hammond talked about in 10 deploys per day, they talked about automated infrastructure, shared version control, uh, one step build and deploy with small frequent changes. Uh, they talked about feature flags and they talked about shared metrics. And then also they talked about uh, IRC and IM robots a bit as well. And then they had a whole cultural aspect that they talked about as well. So respect, tr trust, uh, a healthy attitude towards failure and avoiding blame as well. And if we go back to this definition of cloud native and we think about this, if this is our definition of DevOps and the things that you want to try and incorporate into DevOps, if we're going through those uh, three areas of automation, uh, measurement, and lean, you can see that a lot of these things are actually taken care of for us in the world of cloud native, right? And now that these things are taken care of and we've abstracted these problems away from us, we can begin to focus on the higher level problems, which are the problems that are really hard. Can, who can guess the harder problems on this? Is it the problems on the left or is it the problems on the right? It's probably the problems on the right. And so now that we've abstracted away a lot of this, now we now have time to actually focus on these problems on the right. I had to turn around so I got the left and right correctly. Otherwise, it would have thrown me off. So you might be asking yourself uh, uh, this question, what about my DevOps team though, right? Because uh, I thought I was doing DevOps and so I created this little DevOps team. So DevOps team is a misnomer, uh, and I don't want to be up here and be uh, old man yells at DevOps. <laughs> um, but, but it's an important point to make, right? So, uh, ask, so whenever you say DevOps team, what I want you to say in the back of your head is, do I mean my cultural and professional movement team? 
And then you can start to realize that calling yourself a DevOps team is probably not accurate unless you're also taking into account all of these things over here on the side. So how many people, you don't need to raise your hand, uh, but maybe you do. Uh, how many people actually on their DevOps team take care of those four bullet points on the right? So a, a few of you do, uh, which is really important. Uh, and so uh, a lot of organizations actually just have a DevOps team and they focus on automation. They focus on infrastructure as code. They focus on CI, CD. And they don't focus on those other four challenges there as well. Uh, so typically, your DevOps team is an automation team. And what you really want to think of your DevOps team as, if it is just an automation team, is you want to think of it as a developer services team. And I like this model because what it does is it gets you out of the mindset of having this own little silo to yourself where you're trying to do these DevOps things. And when you think of your, as, yourselves as a developer services team, you have this idea is that you're, um, you're providing a service to someone else, right? You're actually somebody who's trying to build quality into your platform so that other people can get value out of it, right? And so you're focusing on things like continuous delivery pipeline infrastructure. You're focused on the automation framework infrastructure, whether it be Chef, Puppet, Ansible, Kubernetes, uh, how you do your Docker builds and things like that. Uh, you're focusing on things providing artifact repositories and container registries and other aspects like that so that developers can get secure code into their environments as well. And so it changes uh, the conversation, and the way it changes the conversation is, is that you're going to be much more in tune to those four points on the right uh, when you're thinking of yourselves as somebody who provides a service for somebody else instead of yet another gate in the process of trying to deploy software. And there's another term that's popular these days of site reliability engineering. And so this is kind of the next thing where we see everybody starting to rename themselves. So we used to be uh, systems administrators, and then we became systems engineer, and then we went highly specialized into those areas of storage, database, networking, and so forth. And then we've tried to come back around, and now we have DevOps engineers. Uh, and now everybody's kind of, well, I want to be an SRE, because we see that as the next thing coming up. And what's interesting is that if you look at the actual definition for site reliability engineering, it is this idea of a discipline that incorporates aspects of software engineering and applies that to IT operations problem. How many people have ever written code to solve an operations problem before? Right? Congratulations, you're all site reliability engineers. <laughs> But I think there's a really good uh, way that you can look at this. If you actually go to the Wikipedia definition, they do a really good job of mapping the principles of site reliability engineering to the principles of DevOps and how the principles of site reliability engineering actually helps you realize those principles of DevOps. And there's another really good talk uh, by uh, two people, uh, Liz Fong Jones of Google and Seth Vargo also of Google. Um, that's entitled, What's the Difference Between DevOps and SRE? And they talk about this one concept of SRE implements DevOps, right? And I would extend this a little bit further, is that DevOps implements cloud native as well. So what about my DevOps transformation? So in the end, I would say that DevOps is your entire organization's job, not one team. Now what you should be doing is having that team actually go spread those principles of DevOps in your own organization. So ING has done for a long time, I'm not sure if they're still doing it, someone nod, uh, uh, internal uh, DevOps, uh, well, DevOps days, DevOps conferences. Uh, a Target has done this for a long time, Verizon is doing it, Capital One does it. A lot of organizations have their own internal conferences to try and spread these ideas across their entire organization. I would say that cloud native is the, uh, the culmination of these technological advances, advancements. I don't necessarily think that cloud native could have come about whether if, we've been, uh, if we hadn't been necessarily talking about these same principles of culture, automation, lean, measurement, and sharing. I'm not saying that uh, they're necessarily tied to one another. But we have this thing that goes on in technology and we seem to lose focus on it, is that we talk about these same ideas for a really long time, we start to build them into what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, and then the next new thing comes around and we forget about all these principles that we've laid down uh, that got us to where we were. And I really think that cloud native provides real benefits of agility and velocity, just like DevOps provides real benefits. And you can look at the Dora report uh, that shows that you can have real benefits around unlocking uh, agility and velocity in your organization. 
So uh, thank you so much for listening. Uh, I'll be around later if anyone has any questions, uh, either mingling around or over at the Sysdig booth. Uh, here's a few links that I think are useful. Um, the original talk of 10 deploys per day uh, is one that if you haven't watched in a while, it's good to watch it again uh, and kind of remember how we got here and, and why we're here today. So thank you very much. Thank you. Who has a question for Michael? <coughs> Nobody, really. Sorry. Catch. <laughs> hey. So if you if you would look at Agile, I right, take a Scrum team or Kanban team. If you compare that to DevOps, what would be in your vision a um, if you look at the people in the team, uh, a match of their skills, is it application developers? Is it more like DevOps people oriented people? Is it a mix? Uh, I would say it's a mix. Uh, so you definitely have the developer focused teams. Um, but I think what the role of the DevOps team or the developer services team is to be embedded within those different groups. And uh, a model that I've seen work is that you have this developer services team and they might be assigned to uh, three or four different scrum teams. And they're the ones that work side by side to help the developers understand what is the new paradigm, what are the services available to them, how do they build their software inside of containers or whatever your packaging mechanism might be, and how do they use this platform and consume it. And I kind of see it as a model of, uh, if you think of Amazon and Amazon solution architects who will go in and help you use the platform of Amazon, you need to build that exact same thing within your organization and spread those people across those different Agile or Scrum teams. And if you look at Agile and Scrum, of course, a lot of those principles of Lean uh, and DevOps are overlapping with the same principles in Agile and Scrum as well. There's room for one more question. Yeah, Bridget. Okay, throw it. Hey, Juicy, great talk. If you've given us a lot of uh, principles that we got to think about, but if people want to take this idea back to their organizations, if they want to dev some ops in a cloud native way, what's one recommendation that they could implement right away? Short Ooh. answer. <laughs> that sounds like an open space. <laughs> You should propose that for open spaces. Um, I think one thing that people could implement right away uh, is uh, listening. Uh, and so it's not a, a technological thing, but I think we as technologists uh, tend to have this bias, bias towards our experience and our experiencing be, being everything. Who's still pissed off about MySQL 3.2 uh, not being ACID compliant? Anyone? Yep, there we go. We have one person in the room, right? Who still makes the joke about SE Linux, right? That the first thing you do when you uh, stand up a new CentOS or Red Hat box is disable SE Linux, right? And these are some of these foundational things that we carry with us just because we haven't taken the time to listen to others and understand why these things are important. And I think it goes back to that cultural aspect of, of uh, inclusion and diversity and everyone's opinion being important. Already? <laughs> Special one for you, Michael. Thank you. We've got uh, a small guest for all our speakers, but since you're uh, kind of special to us, uh, we are. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you.